Show me your ways, Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me. For you are God my Savior, and my hope is in you all day long.
is a firm foundation I will put my trust in you alone and I will not be shaken I will build my life upon your love it is a firm foundation I will put my trust in I'm leaning on the throne Because you died for me And called me to your own And even when the strongest winds Begin to blow I will stand my ground I will not be moved I will not be shaken Show. Oh.
holding on to what I know Because I know you're always there And I will not be shaken I will not be shaken for our worship service. These indeed are uncertain times, things changing so swiftly it's hard to keep up. But we who believe in the name of Jesus Christ have someone in which we can stand upon who's firm, who's a foundation that does not move like uh, the winds, the changing winds. And so we have our hope in Him. We have our trust in Him. We can stand firmly upon His Word that will never change. And so let us continue to show our trust and our hope in our God. And let's do that right now by having a time of, of prayer. I encourage you, wherever you are, if you are alone or if you are with your family, let's take some time to, to pray together, to go ahead and pray in response to what we have just sung of how we do stand upon our God. We do stand upon His Word. We believe in Him. We trust in Him. And His power and presence is with us in any and every circumstance. So would you please join us in praying together?
Let's pray. Maker of heaven and earth, you are our help. We lift our eyes to you. As we walk this Lenten journey, you watch over our coming and our going, both now and forevermore. You are our shade and our protection. You are always with us. We ask that you strengthen and guide us as we do your work in your world. Convict us of our disobedience and enable us to obey your call in our lives. Open our ears to the cry of the poor. Teach us to seek and to do justice, to stay in the path of understanding, to pursue righteousness and love. In the strong name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, as Moses was in the desert and very concerned about what was happening, Lord, you asked him, is the arm of the Lord too short? You were telling Moses, trust me, I got this. And the prophet Habakkuk was worried about his situation and the crisis he was facing. And as he laid out his worries to you, he was at the end able to say, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. Father, we ask today that you would help us to trust you, to know that you've got this. Help us to rejoice in you and to put our trust in the God of our salvation. And we thank you and praise you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea. A great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me. My name is graven on his hands, my name is written on his heart. I know that while in heaven he stands, no tongue can bid me thence depart. No tongue can bid me thence depart. When Satan tempts me to despair And tells me of the guilt within Upward I look and see him there made an end to all my sin because the sinless savior died my sinful soul is counted free for god the just is satisfied to look on him and pardon me to look on him and pardon me The great unchangeable I am The King of glory and of grace One with himself I cannot die My soul is purchased with his blood My life is hid with Christ on high With Christ my Savior and my God One with himself I cannot die My soul is purchased with his blood My life
life is hid with Christ on high, with Christ my Savior and my God, with Christ my Savior and my God, with Christ my Savior and my God. Welcome to Lakeside's newest version of doing worship services. So glad that you're able to tune in this morning. And I can only imagine that you're sitting in your sofas or reclining in your chairs or whatever, drinking some coffee, relaxing, tuning in. Thank you for doing that. I think that's really, really cool. And I want to thank Tim, too. Tim, thank you for all that you put into uh, putting this together. I know he, I know Tim, you welcomed everybody. And thank you too, Tim, for, for the songs that you put together for this message. Um, I know you always do a great job with that, and I really appreciate it. Some of you may be tuning in later on, and if that is the case, thank you for doing that, because I believe that our message this morning may be the most important message in this series that we've been on, this series that, that Jesus is greater. Jesus is greater. We're, we're working through our Lent series. Um, it's interesting, too, that here we are only two weeks away from Easter, and it's kind of hard to comprehend based on what we've been experiencing in our world, but um, here we are. So, very grateful to bring God's word to you. And if you would just bow your heads with me for a moment, that we can just seek the Lord right now and ask for his blessing upon this message. Let's pray. Father, it is so good to be here in your sanctuary. And what a blessing and honor it is for me to bring your people your amazing and most powerful word. And God, I'm excited about this message. I have been looking forward to getting on this pulpit, bringing this message, because I believe, Lord, in my heart that this may be the most important message in this series. And so I pray, Holy Spirit, that you will bless the words that come out of my mouth. And there may be things, Lord, that I was not anticipating sharing in this message. May that be led by you. Father, I love you. We love you so much. We need you so much. And so I ask now, Lord, that you'll take this message and just blow us away with your power, with your love, and with your glory in the name of Jesus. Amen. So we've been looking at Jesus is greater. If you haven't listened yet to the first message, about three weeks ago, how we focused on Jesus is the greatest. I want to encourage you to do that because that message kind of sets up all these other messages. And two weeks ago, we focused how, how Jesus is greater than angels. Been thinking about that a little bit in regards to angels because most of the time in the Bible, when angels would approach man, Man had no other choice but to fall down in, in, in amazing fear because angels were so powerful. They were so glorious. They were, they were mind-blowing that you couldn't even look at them. But yet Jesus is greater than angels. And then last week we looked at Jesus is greater than Moses. 
You know, just reading through the Old Testament again and reading through the stories. Like right now, I've been in this Deuteronomy where, 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 where Moses is, is preaching and he's kind of rehashing all that Israel had been through. And it's so powerful that I, I, I just, I love Moses. I think he is an amazing man or was an amazing man, a great leader. And, but Jesus, Jesus is obviously greater than Moses. Well, this morning we're going to be focusing on Jesus is greater than priests. Now, I want to focus on an introduction here before I get into God's Word. Now, the book of Hebrews was written to a group of Jews who were exiled from Israel. The book focuses on the Jewish community to encourage them to continue to walk with Jesus. Now, while the book was written mostly to believers, it was also written to unsaved Jews who abandoned Judaism, but who have yet to believe in Jesus themselves. The Jews who received this letter were used to gaining access to God through a human priest. And the writer of Hebrews wants them to know, through saving faith, that there is a high priest who is far greater than any human priest. And these verses highlight the characteristics of that make Jesus worthy to be called our great high priest. I believe there is some much needed help in these verses today. We need to be reminded that Jesus is our great high priest. You see, we all need help as we pass through this world. We need someone to support us, someone to encourage us, someone to strengthen us. And the person that we need is revealed in this passage. So let's look. Let's look at Hebrews 4. And I'm only going to be reading just two verses, two powerful verses this morning. Verses 14 through 16. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence, so that we, so that we may receive mercy and find grace in our time of need. So Jesus Christ, God's Son, is the supreme high priest. He's the greatest high priest who has ever stood between God and man. And this fact, this truth, is beyond amazing. It is beyond comforting. Like there, there are no words to describe how powerful that is, that we have a God, we have a Savior, we have a high priest who stands between us and God. And as the great high priest, he is able to sympathize with us, to actually feel every experience that we experience, no matter how painful. And Jesus not only feels for us, he feels right alongside of us. He is our great 
sympathetic high priest. The one who meets our every need and carries us through all the sufferings of this life. This morning, we are going to look at the significance of Jesus being the high priest. And what does it mean? What does it mean for us today? What does it mean for us now? Now, you'll notice in your outline, and, and I, I hope that you are able to, you know, print out a copy of, of, of the outline. And, and you know what? I really want to encourage you to, to fill in the blanks because this message isn't only meant for you to listen to it today, but it's meant to carry it through the rest of the week. And so you can go back and you can look at the outline and, and seeing what you wrote in the blanks is going to help you remember what we are focusing on this morning. So I really want to encourage you to do that. But notice with me the characteristics that are revealed about Jesus in these verses. The first is this. Our high priest is superior. Our high priest is superior. Let me read again. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. So we see here in these verses, we see a few things. And the first is this, is that he is superior in his personality. One of the things I like about preaching is being able to kind of give you a, a historical perspective of, of what it was like back in the Bible times. And so the ancient Jews, the ancient Jews depended on their high priest. He was a man who represented them to God interceded them interceded for them before God and he would offer blood sacrifices that atoned for their sins and their high priest was an important part of their lives was was an important part of their worship was an important part of their relationship to God but there was a major problem with all this the Jewish high priest were mere human. You see, they needed forgiveness too. Just like the people they were representing, they too needed forgiveness. They were sinners too, and they were prone to failure just like those they represented to the Lord. But our high priest, our high priest is superior because he is not like a human high priest. He is the son of God. He is God. He is sinless. And he cannot even sin, even if he wanted to, even if he tried. He cannot fail and, and he doesn't need forgiveness because he is perfect. So we see that Jesus is superior in his personality. And we also see that Jesus is superior in his performance. In his performance. Now every year on the Day of Atonement, the high priest offered a sacrifice for the sins of of the people but before he could enter the presence of God which are which is which is the holy of holies before he could enter the presence of God he had to offer sacrifices for his own sins first he would then take the blood of sacrifice into the holy of holies and sprinkle it on what is called the mercy seat. Now as time, 
His time in the Holy of Holies, his time in God's presence was limited. Only enough time to offer sacrifices. And then when he was done, he had to get out quickly. There was no, there was no, what's the word, uh, diddly, diddly dally, whatever you want to call that. I, I don't know what it is, but don't mess around in the Holy of Holies. You get in, do your thing, you get out. And every year, this same process had to be repeated. Now, what's interesting, to get to the Holy of Holies, the priest had to pass through three entrances. The first entrance was the gate to the courtyard of their tabernacle. And you know, I can only imagine that this priest, even when he gets to this point, the gate to the courtyard of the tabernacle, that he's not nonchalant about it. I think the priest is putting on his game face because he knows that he is entering into a holy place. You just don't kind of nonchalant open the gate and say, oh, I'm going to go, I'm going to go hang out with God or whatever for a little while. No. He had to enter the courtyard of the tabernacle first. Then he had to open the door or, or enter the door, enter through the door into a, the holy place. Then he had to go through the veil into the holy of holies. This was an amazing process. A process that had to be taken ever so serious. Now Jesus, on the other hand, he had no sins of his own, but he made atonement for our sins. He didn't have to offer blood of an animal, but his own sinless blood he offered. He didn't have, excuse me, he didn't have to repeat this every year. What he did stands forever. He did not take his blood through three entrances, but he did take it through three heavens. First, the atmosphere, then the outer space, and then into the celestial city of God to enter into the presence of God. See, his blood paid my our eternal payment for my sin once and for all. He did what no human priest has ever done, sat down at the right hand of God because his work was forever completed. And that's phenomenal. That is phenomenal. Well, the third thing we see here in regards to Jesus' superiority, his personality, is he is superior in his people. See, the Jews were an inconsistent, pain-in-the-neck people. And I'm tempted to use another phrase in regards to how much of a pain these Jews were. Because no matter how many times the priest offered sacrifices for them, no matter how many times he did this, they would commonly abandon their commitment to the Lord. Time and time again, they wandered away from God. Doesn't that sound familiar even in our day? See, Jesus is superior to human priests because his people hold firmly to the faith. This means they persevere in their commitment to him. Now, we, 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 we fail, don't we, from time to time? But true believers, they never walk away from God. Never walk away. 
And we may falter and we may, we may waver, but we never give up on God. Those are true believers. And how do you know? How do you know when a person is the real deal? How do you know a, a person who's a real follower of Jesus? Well, they have a, a new birth. Their lives have changed and they, they have this fervent desire to live for the Lord and to walk with him daily. And Jesus is superior to an earthly priest because his followers are committed to him and his will. So we see, we see this first thing. We see the superiority of Jesus' personality. Well, then we see this. The second main point, the second main characteristic is we see our high priest is sympathetic. He has the ability to sense our pain. It says, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as you are, or just as we are, yet was without sin. You know, we are living in such a weird time, aren't we? I mean, it's just so strange. I'm, I, I, you know, there's a lot of different emotions that, that I've been trying to work through in regards to where we're at in this world and the things that we're dealing with. And this is such an important passage for me as well because I need to know that Jesus is sympathizing with my confusion. And so we see this here. We see that, that, that he feels our pain. He feels our pain. You'll see that in your outline there. He feels our pain. Remember, remember Stephen, the disciple Stephen? Do you remember when, when, when you know, he was just proclaiming Jesus in such a powerful way, just authentically walking with God, representing Jesus to the best of his ability, and he got stoned for his faith? It says the Holy Spirit allowed Stephen to see into heaven. And he saw Jesus watching from God's throne. See, what I see there, I see a sympathetic Savior who is aching for his son, Stephen, because Jesus knows the pain, the physical pain he's suffering, but he also knows his amazing commitment to Jesus and so I, I, I see Jesus sympathetically standing before the right hand of God, just like, man, just aching for Stephen. And he also felt the pain of those being persecuted as well, because he tells Saul, he tells Saul, he says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? You see, there's pain in that question, because it's not just, it's not just Jesus that he's persecuting. Jesus is speaking for all Christians who are being persecuted and saying, why are you persecuting me? Because he is feeling their pain. And when his children are hurt, he hurts too. That's why that's why Jesus listens intently when we seek him in prayer. And the second thing we see is Jesus is familiar with our problems. Well, some may ask, how do you know that? How can Jesus know what I'm going through? He's perfect and he's way up in heaven. How can he possibly know how I feel? Well, he knows what we feel because he has lived what we live. 
He has experienced the things we experience, the hardships. He gets it. He's familiar with our problems. Well, what are some of those problems? Number one is this. He understands temptation. He understands temptation. Remember in, 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 in Matthew when it talks about Jesus was tempted in the desert by Satan 40 days and 40 nights. And we can't even comprehend what that was like for him. And then we see the nature of his temptations are the same nature of our temptations that we see in 1 John 2, 16, which says, For everything in the world, the cravings of sinful man, the lust of his eyes, and the boasting of what he has and does comes not from the Father, but from the world. You see, Jesus was tempted in all these areas just like us. But get this. Get this. His temptations may have been more severe because of the fact that he was sinless. You see, Jesus was not only sinless, he was and is incapable of sinning. Therefore, Jesus had such a, a hatred, a, a disgust for sin that we can never comprehend. And for Jesus to come face to face with sin was a horrible experience for him. This means that he can help us when we are tempted. Jesus hates sin. Because he sees what sin does every day in our lives. The brokenness of our world. He sees it, therefore he hates it. And as a Christian, we are encouraged to hate it as well. Because we see what it's doing in our lives and the people around us. Well, the second thing that Jesus experienced also that we experience is he understands rejection he understands rejection john 6 66 excuse me in john 6 66 i'm getting kind of kind of getting a little ahead of myself here because i'm pumped up it says this from from this time many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him That's a big deal because Jesus understood what it meant to be rejected by those he loved most. He knows what it's like to have people turn their back on you. In fact, he knows what it's like to face something that none of us who are Christians will ever experience. And that is to have God turn his back on us. Remember Matthew 27, 46 says this. It says, about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice. Eloi, Eloi, lama tsamathani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Can you see it? Can you imagine the expression on Jesus, his body, his face, when he's crying out to God because he feels like he is forsaken by the one who loves him the most? So don't you think then, don't you think that Jesus understands when we feel rejected? You bet he does. He suffered this way so that he can relate to us when we feel rejected. And the third thing, he also understands poverty and need. Matthew 8, 20, it says, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. 
It tells me that Jesus was homeless. He was homeless. Even in Matthew 17, we read that even Jesus paid taxes like we do. Therefore, Jesus understands being in need. He understands tough, excuse me, tough times. And the fourth thing is he also understands grief. You know, the shortest verse in the Bible is John eleven thirty five 35, that says, Jesus wept. And in Luke 19, 41 says, as he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it. Jesus understands grief. He knows what it's like to lose someone you love. He loved Lazarus. And, he, and, and, and it caused him so much pain to watch Mary and Martha cry over the death of their brother. And he wept with them because he too experienced grief. He understands those times of loss and he understands our broken hearts. Well, the fifth thing also that Jesus can relate to is he understands loneliness. In Matthew 26, 39, it says, going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and he prayed, my father, if it is impossible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. And so I don't picture Jesus there just kind of having a nonchalant conversation with God of just, you know, kind of just, I, I see a passion here. I see a brokenness. He's feeling so alone. Jesus knows what it's like when, 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 when we feel, remember, remember when sometimes, I, I remember this when I was a kid, but I would, I would think, man, no one understands what I'm going through. No one understands the pain and the loneliness that I'm experiencing. And we too can never understand the loneliness that Jesus was feeling in the Garden of Gethsemane at that time. So therefore, he knows what it means to hurt. And he knows, and he, or, or he wants to help us through those lonely times. Or our last thing here is this. Or our last main characteristic, I should say, is our high priest is our sanctuary. You see, he has the ability. He has the ability to solve our problems. Because it says here again, it says, let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. And because Jesus understands us, he endured the full force of temptation. He is able to help us with whatever we face. That is why he invites us to come run to him. Run to his sanctuary in times of trouble. And what else do we see in this verse? We see his petition that we approach with confidence. With confidence. Go to prayer in confidence. Now, this was foreign. This was a foreign concept for the Jews. They had no clue what the writer of Hebrews is saying here. They couldn't ma imagine a, 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 a God who, who, who would invite people to come before him anytime they wanted. They couldn't comprehend that. Because in ancient times, 
a king would, would only be approached when he invited you to approach him. And the Jews, the Jews had the same idea about God. They didn't, have, they didn't have a confidence that they can approach God's throne like we do. And the writer of Hebrews wants us to know that we can, we can approach God anytime. But here's the deal. Here's the deal. Why is it? Why is it that God should be our first resort, but he ends up being our last resort? We try everything else, don't we? We, we try, well, let's worry. Let's worry. Maybe that'll solve the problem. Or, or, or self-pity, oh, woe with me. Maybe, maybe God will have mercy on me because he sees how, how pitiful I am. Or self-effort, we're like, well, we'll figure it out. Let's just figure it out on our own. And when all those things fail, we decide to run to Jesus, which is great. But here's the deal. If we run to Jesus first, we can eliminate all the casualties of extra problems that have come because we decided to figure it out on our own first. See, we'll try everything else before we seriously seek help from the Lord. You see, here's God's plan for us when we feel that we're in trouble. Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Do not be anxious about anything. Stop for a second. Don't be anxious about this coronavirus situation. Don't be anxious about it. But in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your mind in Christ Jesus. Here's another, 1 Peter 5, 7. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. How appropriate this is, right? Because we are in anxious times, but cast these anxious times on him because he cares for you. He loves you you so much. Well, in this last verse, we also see his power. Now, earthly kings in those days had power over their people. They literally had power to allow you to live or die. And they possessed great power, but all the kings combined all their power combined is nothing compared to Jesus's power why because the power of any king is only as great as the power of the kingdom behind him so what kind of power does Jesus have then first and this is not in your outline so just listen he has exceeding power. He can do immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine. And you know what? Some of us have amazing imaginations. Well, Jesus can go above and beyond your imagination with his exceeding power. And he also has need meaning power. He will supply all your needs according to his glorious riches. Do you remember the Israelites when they didn't deserve this whatsoever? 
When the Israelites rebelled against God and he said, that's it. That's it. You guys are not going to get into the promised land for 40 years. You're going to wander in the desert. But because God is such a great God anyway, what happened? He still met their needs because all of their clothing for 40 years and their sandals never wore out. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine still having the same tennis shoes that you had 40 years ago and they still haven't worn out? Or, or, or the clothes that you have that you wore 40 years ago didn't wear out? That's because God is a need-meeting, powerful God. And he is also a cleansing and a healing, powerful God because his blood purifies us. He is also a load lifting power because he says, he says, come to me all who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. He has all power because all authority, all authority in, in heaven and in earth has been given to him. His power and then lastly, his promise. The Bible says, when we come to Jesus in a time of need, we will receive mercy and find grace. See, that's a promise. And here are a couple more as I, as I, as I get close to wrapping up this message. Here are a couple more promises in times of struggle. Psalm 46, 1 says, God is our refuge and strength an ever-present help in trouble. And then Psalm 55, 22, cast your cares on the Lord and he will sustain you he will never let the righteous fall. Let me try to conclude what I think is a powerful message. These are kind of like no-brainer questions, but I'm going to ask them anyway. Do you ever need help? Do you ever face trials that threaten to overwhelm you? Do you ever go through temptations that appear to be on your power? Yes. Yes, at times you do, and so do I. But we have a great high priest. He is superior in every way. He is sympathetic in every need. He has the ability to sense our pain. And he is our sanctuary in every trial. He has the ability to solve our problems. And so my question is, has he spoken to you today is he speaking to you today? Because I hope he is. Especially in these times of uncertainty of what this COVID-19 means in our lives. And we can come to him and we can find a help because he's our great high priest. And I know for a fact, because I feel it in my heart, God is allowing this virus to change our lives. God is allowing this virus to help us reboot, to think about what is most important. I was sitting there thinking about how in the Ten Commandments, one of the commandments says, there, Thou shalt not have any other gods before me. You know, one of the things that, that this God that's been taken out of the scene for right now is this God of sports. 
this God of, of, of baseball and, 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 and basketball and all these things. And I get it. I love sports. Don't get me wrong. I love it. But I see God removing things to say, look, people, I am God who loves you. And I'm not going to get rid of this virus until I got your complete attention. Because I am the great high priest and I demand and I deserve that you pay attention to me. Because I love you and you need me. Man, oh man, this is powerful stuff. Thank you. Thank you for letting me come into your, 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 your living rooms or your kitchen or wherever you find yourself listening to this message. And I hope, I hope this message has encouraged you. I hope you can go into this next week, which is uncertain, and say, you know what? I got a high priest. I don't care about this coronavirus. I don't care about anything else. All I know is I've got an awesome God who loves me. In the name of Jesus, let's pray. Father, man, oh man. Here I am again, Lord. Here I am again. Preaching to nobody in the sanctuary, but that's okay. Because they're out there, Lord. They're out there and they're listening. And I am so grateful for that. Thank you for your spirit. Thank you for your power. Thank you for this passion that's been brewing inside of me to bring your powerful word this morning. And I pray, Lord God, that we are all encouraged and we're like, yes, yes, yes. Let's continue to focus on God. Let's take advantage, God, of this coronavirus in our world. And we do pray, Lord, we pray for those who have this virus. God bless them. Please, Lord, please. Spare them, sustain them, heal them, protect us from getting this virus, but help us pay attention. Help us change our lives because of what's going on in our world today. In the name of Jesus, amen. The Lord's our rock. In Him we hide A shelter in the time of storm Secure whatever ill be tied A shelter in the time of storm O oh, rock divine, O oh, Dear, a shelter in the time of storm. Be thou our helper ever near, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a weary Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a shelter in the time of storm.
best I